We have two really excellent speakers, uh, people at the top of the knowledge on the subject of, of drones. Um, anybody here not know what a drone is? Good. <laughs> so, uh, yes, we, we, everybody. Oh, everybody, okay. okay. Uh, so, we're going to start with uh, Dr. Peter Lee. He's from Portsmouth University and also from Cranwell University. He, he lectures in um, ethics and warfare. And then we'll follow up with uh, Professor Sharkey, who I'll introduce <laughs> in a bit. Hopefully, we can get his technology work. So, over to you, Peter. Thanks very much. Thank you for uh, coming along for what will hopefully be an interesting period this afternoon. Um, just a little bit about myself, because it's sometimes helpful to know where your speaker is coming from, what's their, their context. I was in the Air Force, I've been, I've been an officer in the Air Force, I have been a chaplain in the Air Force. Um, I've been an academic now for five years, first at King's College London, now at Portsmouth, and my, my first book last year was Blair's Just War, Iraq and the Illusion of Morality, highly critical of the, the Iraq War, and I spend a lot of my time teaching, although I work for Portsmouth University, teaching Air Force officer cadets and kind of senior middle management Air Force officers wing commander rank. And one of my jobs is to ask them all the questions that they find really, really uncomfortable. <coughs> so I, I am coming from the perspective that a large amount of use of drones that we have is uncontroversial. I don't think anyone would complain that drones were used to put forest fires out in Australia at the weekend. I'm assuming people don't have a great problem with drones being used to monitor the coral reefs similarly around Australia, uh, drones being used to monitor farmers' fields, um, try to think of one or two other ones. Yes, tracking, tracking animals in, in Kenya and the Maasai Mara, using drones to track them. I'm assuming all of that is relative, relatively uncontroversial regarding the odd issue of observance, you know, observation human rights, because I think what you probably want to talk about and what is the most controversial end of the use is the bit that goes bang. It's a bit that kills people, and let's make no bones about it, when we talk about kinetic strike and elimination, killing people. So that's largely what I'm going to focus on today. Um, I'll define my, my talk a little bit more, but I want to start by looking at something that came up in a parliamentary debate, and it sums up many of the emotions and controversies surrounding this, this whole issue. You should never put this much text on a screen, but I want, I want you to see what the MP has actually said. I'm not going to read the whole thing, please. Just take a moment and read it. <coughs> Captures a lot of the, the controversy surrounding drones, appearing over capitals, centres of mobilisation, bases of operation. Indeed, even before war is declared, you can use these things. At a time when the places are considered to be secure against attack, dropping explosives, etc. Drones can do that. What's interesting about this and the demoralizing effect it has is I put the word drones in, in brackets because this was not a debate recently. This was a debate in 1909 and it concerns aircraft. About five, six years after aircraft came into existence, people were already worried about cities being bombed. Why? Aircraft could hardly keep themselves in the air in 1909, never mind drop anything heavy. But H.G. Wells had written War of the Worlds. And it scared the crap out of everybody. So what you see here is not a response to aircraft, it's a response to mass hysteria surrounding H.G. Wells. And I just float the idea before I begin that much of what we hear about drones is similarly informed more by the film Terminator which is my generation, I'm kind of showing my age now, than it is about what they can actually do at the moment. So moving on to a bit about language and meaning, because what do we mean by drones? Both of these are drones by whatever definition you want to use. And here are some of the most commonly used names. We've got drone, which is the one in used in newspapers. Uh, UAV unmanned aerial vehicle. There was a great, great piece from the BBC recently when asked to comment on the use of one of these for a police riot. The journalist was so caught up in being uh, in conforming to BBC guidelines and not offending on anyone that he called them unpersoned aerial vehicles. 
I just <laughs> thought that. <laughs> Unmanned aerial vehicles. And then we've got RPA, RPAF, remotely piloted <coughs> aircraft or remotely piloted aircraft systems. Now, for the sake of clarity, what I'm going to talk about are the last of these, remotely piloted aircraft or remotely piloted aircraft systems. And I'm going to talk about the big ones that can blow stuff up. And in case you think it's a made-up thing, that's actually the terminology used by the Civil Aviation Authority, the European Aviation Authority, and the International Civil Aviation Authority. So I'm talking about remotely piloted aircraft or aircraft systems. Um, the two most uh, well-known ones, controversial, are the Predator and the Reaper, both operated by the United States Air Force, the Reaper also operated by the Royal Air Force. And I'm in a rather unusual position for a civilian academic in that I actually get to go and see these things. So I've been to Creech in the summer, I get to spend time in the squadrons, I've been to Waddington uh, a week past Friday, and I get to spend time sitting in the box where the controlling is going on, looking at the screens at what they do. Uh, so if I'm offering an opinion on something, I like to think it's reasonably well informed as opposed to something that is built on hearsay, built on stereotype, built upon someone's pejorative idea because it makes sense. So hopefully I'll say one or two things to you today that will be perhaps a bit counterintuitive. So that's terminology I'm going to talk about remotely piloted. And then the next warning is beware of the conflations. What do I mean by that? In all of this discussion, and I, I'm sorry, I don't have the, the actual description of this, this debate in front of me that was emailed to me yesterday, but what we see regularly conflated are a number of things. Um, from a British perspective, the UK, and for that is Royal Air Force use of drones, the Reaper, is almost exclusively in every TV discussion presentation conflated with the CIA's use of it and the United States Air Force use of it. So whenever, and I, I, I am I'm not a pacifist, but I'm most certainly not a realist. And if I sit somewhere in the middle that says, I believe that sometimes you can use force, you know, sometimes engaging a lesser evil to defeat a e greater evil, that's where I'm seated. Seated. I know I can speak in proper England, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, that's where I'm seated. <laughs> Betraying my Scottish roots. Damn education, it was bad in the 80s as well. Um, so I'm sitting in the middle allowing that sometimes force can and indeed should be used, and I'm glad they did in 1939 against Nazism, but as I mentioned in my book about Blair in Iraq, more often than not highly critical, especially when it's used inappropriately. But what I don't want to do is try and pretend that I'm going to um, speak about autonomy, which, which I know Noel's going to speak about afterwards, uh, perhaps a bit more. I'm talking about remotely piloted as opposed to small handheld line of sight, things that you can use for riot observations. Um, and I'm not going into the autonomous because we can discuss it in question and answer, but I firmly believe if you want to have an ethical use of anything, you have a human being involved at some stage and to some degree. And this is the, 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 the conflation that I've already mentioned. That CIA, I'm not going to say anything other than criticize the CIA's use of, of Reaper in Pakistan. I couldn't believe at the weekend that they were congratulating themselves on, on killing. Uh, oh, sorry, I thought I had a picture there. In killing the leader of the Pakistan Taliban, because all they've done is interrupt a peace process that was hopefully going to make Pakistan more stable. And what they've done is they've killed the leader of Pakistan Taliban, made them walk at least temporarily away from the peace process for the sake of killing one individual. And if many of you, hopefully, you'll, you'll study war as part of your, and, and peace, more importantly, as part of your, your studies here. You don't end a war just by killing everybody. It rarely happened in history. You usually have to come to a political accommodation afterwards. So who now in the Taliban is going to come forward in Pakistan to negotiate peace if they think their postcode is going to get vis visited by a paveway missile? So the American CIA use Certainly for me, I'm not going to approach anything like an ethical defense of what they do. I think it's political abuse. I've mentioned it there. But I'm equally convinced that the Royal Air Force, and I'm not going to pretend that war is a non-combat sport, non-contact sport. War is about killing people. Humanitarian intervention is an oxymoron. 
actually led by a moron. So that's <laughs> <laughs> sorry. That you'll not get an unbiased view of Tony Blair from me. I'm I, 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 I know the academics are supposed to be unbiased. At least you know where I stand. <laughs> Humanitarian intervention is an oxymoron. It's military intervention. It kills people in pursuit of political aims. So let's again talk about language and meaning. Let's be clear. I like to be very clear about what I'm talking about. So if you're intervening with force, you better have a damn good reason for doing so, and I'll come on to that in a little while. And when you do it, you better do it in as, as ethical as way as possible. And the key words which I'll come to are discrimination, proportionality, and, and a few others. So these are some of the ideas that get lumped together. The CIA uses drones, kill civilians in Pakistan. All drones are bad, therefore the UK should not allow drones to fly. That argument has been presented, I don't know how many times in my hearing. And all of those things are not separated. And, and these drones can go out and then they, they kill people. No, they don't. They're piloted. They're piloted by an experienced pilot. Well, that could change. And that is not the case for the United States. They're very inexperienced pilots. But they're piloted. You have a sensor operator who does all the weaponry. You have an intelligence coordinator who's taking all sorts of, they don't just fly around, the Royal Air Force anyway, the CIA do different signature strikes again, which are, are beyond the pale in my view. The British Reaper does not fly around with pilots looking for stuff to blat. It just, <laughs> they just don't. They, run, they operate to the same rules of engagement same legal application, same application of the Geneva Conventions and international law as all of the other aircraft that the Air Force operate. So just a bit of clarification on that. When they're going out, they're not just going out saying, oh, uh, he, he looks about 20 years old, he's got a rifle, we're just going to blow him up. CIA might do that in Pakistan, in my view, highly immoral, highly illegal. But what is it about the, the, the Reaper in particular that makes it, in my view, and this is the thing that usually upsets most people, used properly, and not that phrase, the most ethical means of delivering air power, yet devised. What makes the Reaper the most ethical means of delivering air power, yet devised? Key characteristics are these, persistence and precision. Persistence as in they can fly over a target for 10, 12 hours without having to go away and refuel. They can fly um, all that time, and the operators, you can never do that in an aircraft, even if you drug, so even give someone stimulants. Um, not that students have ever done that, and not that anyone takes anything now to get them through exams, I'm pretty sure. But pilots, <laughs> <laughs> laughter is an admission of guilt. Um, pilots historically have been stimulated. That's really not a good sentence. Um, <laughs> pilots historically have used drugs to keep them stimulated and focused for long periods of time. The Reaper can observe a target for great lengths of time beyond physical endurance. So it allows pattern of life to be established. It allows time to double, triple check, and more if necessary. Uh, your intelligence, your legal basis, and so on. And precision. Precision is an interesting thing. They are incredibly precise. If there was a Reaper flying overhead here, they wouldn't be directly overhead. If they're going to hit it, it would be flying off at an angle. But it could decide which of these doors it wanted its missile to come through, if they're using a small Hellfire missile. They are unbelievably accurate. The bigger missiles just kill everything in the vicinity, that's for sure. So you could certainly kill everyone in this room and leave the other room with quite a lot of survivors in it if you use a small enough missile. Use a big enough missile, the whole building's out of commission. So it is very precise. And, and having been very critical of the, the political value of killing the, the Taliban chief at the weekend, think about what they did technically. I know it's a kind of sick thing to do, but think about what they did technically. A man who never stayed for more than six hours in one place was in a vehicle moving into a compound. And somehow intelligence got from the ground through the CIA, however it managed it, to some controller who pressed the button who blew up that vehicle. Technically, you've got to say that's quite a feat of engineering. 
despite my political criticisms, and, and they are severe. I'm not going to justify it. So what are some of the, the basis upon which I say that the Reaper is the most ethical means of delivering air power yet devised? Not I said best, not perfect. No such thing as when you're using explosives, people die. And people die accidentally. No, that's not a good phrase either. Now there's collateral damage. People die being in the wrong place at the wrong time, when the wrong weapons are used for the wrong targets in the wrong amounts. But proportionality is about the amount of force that you need to use. When, if any of you are studying the just war tradition, juice and bellow, proportionality discrimination, key aspects of how you, how you execute war. The same principles can apply to any, any use of force. The police use this term. Do you, have you used a proportionate amount of force to detain such a person? And if anyone thinks we, we don't use force in our, in our judicial system, we use force in our judicial system. When you're standing in a dock and you get sentenced to six months in prison, and you say, no, I don't fancy it, do you think you're going to be allowed to walk out of there? We use force in our judicial system. Maybe just not in the way that some countries do. So what kind of precision we talk about proportionality? Here we have a before and after shot, literally shot. Um, you can see a vehicle on the right, several people walking around about it. Um, you can see the detail. Um, trained observers can tell you what type of vehicle it is, what the make and model is. And they can tell the colors of the jackets that the human beings are, are wearing, etc. And just for effect, I put up a B-52. And I met a B-52 pilot um, at Annapolis, the American naval base, last year. And I was asking about using B-52 in, in Vietnam. They used it, so to be slightly technical, for, for tactical delivery of air power. Um, rescue a group of soldiers, send in some B-52s. And he described occasions where if soldiers wanted to walk from A to B, he said three B-52s fully loaded. If they needed to get rid of the explosives, they could just line them up and cut through the jungle a four to 800 meter gash wide wide and up to four and five miles long you want a safe walk through the jungle we'll do that now i would suggest to you that that is much more proportionate use of force if you're going to use force pacifism is a discussion for another day and a very valuable one that versus that gives you two very different outcomes this is not going to just destroy bits of the car and some of the people around about it this is going to destroy the entire south end of this city I mentioned Hellfire missiles, very small uh, payload. The United Kingdom, as far as I'm aware, and this isn't just from military sources, this is open source as well, have not used payway missiles in two years. They're the bigger ones. And the use of Hellfire has gone up exponentially because the, the Royal Air Force squadrons are effectively operating at a, what they call zero civcars, zero civilian casualties. If they can't be damn sure there's going to be no civilian casualties, finger off the trigger. Because politically, what would it do next week if a British Reaper killed seven children outside the school? Politically, it's unsustainable. Hasn't happened yet, but can always, things can always go wrong. Discrimination. This is, this is the interesting bit. Um, I think it's Malia Malaya Benjamin writes, the biggest ethical problem with drones is they make killing too easy. I ask you to think about the word easy for a minute. Easy in what way? Is it physically? Well, I described how technically the challenge of pressing a button in one continent and somebody hitting a radius of about 25 feet on another continent through satellite links, through all kinds of communications, every bit of which could break down. Easy, certainly not technically easy, and I'll come to psychologically easy in a minute. And here, the UN Special Rapporteur, drones contribute more, it is often said that drones contribute towards more accurate targeting and can reduce civilian casualties. He actually said that in a pejorative way, as in he dismissed it utterly. What was really interesting though is, he didn't mention the Royal Air Force or the United Kingdom in his report. It was all Pakistan. Well, not in terms of civilian casualties and, and so on. Because it did not fit his narrative. His narrative is drones bad, 
and what the CIA, I will concede absolutely I'm with them on that. But the UK, <coughs> Royal Air Force, just not doing enough damage to warrant attention by the UN's rapporteur. He also went on to address the utility, as in stuff that's useful for politicians to use. He went on to say, drones not only make it um, physically easier to dispatch long distance and targeted armed force, but the proliferation of drones may lower social barriers in society against deployment of lethal force. And he's got a very good point, I think. Paul, at the weekend, 83% of Americans are content with the use of drone strikes in Pakistan. Their view is, if there's no American boys getting killed, that's good enough for me. Does it lower the threshold? Because the military has always been involved at lots of levels from disaster relief. A Royal Navy helicopter is used largely, well, pr designed primarily for a war fighting f facility, but they're used for helping earthquake victims. And somewhere in here, war does not have a, uh, have a fixed line like that, <coughs> war and peace. There are these blurred edges, and I think they're absolutely right. Reaper and the likes allow you to move the use of force for the political will needed further in this direction. And I'll, add, uh, I'll say in a minute what I think the consequences are. Peter Singer, Wired for War, the UAV crew is now fully disconnected from war. <coughs> and similarly, Peter Olstorn with physical and psychological distance. And what is interesting is, when you look to see how many of the pilots he spoke to, you will look in vain. Here's a pilot I interviewed earlier this year on the subject of easier, physically easier. I've killed it, and this is not a boast, this is somebody extremely regretful. Very aware of, no, regretful is not the right word. This is someone who is aware of the consequences of taking human life and lives with that fact. The body's reactions are the same, it surprised me. Your mouth goes dry and the hairs of the back of your neck stand up. Everything goes tense and you get that sick feeling in your stomach. You know what you're about to do. This is the same, this is sitting in a box thousands of miles away. Same physical reactions, which is intriguing. Another, I know not a, it's a very long quote, but it's, I'm getting near the end, so it's worth looking at. This, this is another one, which is actually one of my publications. I reject the idea that you know, we're capable of reducing the taking of life to a PlayStation game because of 12,000 <coughs> miles away. Everything we do is being watched by others. General officers, legal advisors, ops officers, and the command center that make us more rather than less aware of the consequences of the action we take. We have the capacity to see. So when they, and what he said to me is, when we see somebody and we're going to kill them, we watch for several days. You know that's a fully rounded human being. That's where he goes to mosque, that's where he, and it is Muslims in, in Afghanistan and that have been killed. That's where he goes to mosque, that's his wife, those are his children, that's his friends, that's where he makes the bombs. So they know, and then afterwards, they watch as the bits are put in a wheelbarrow for burial before sundown. And they live with that. Not because of some voyeuristic tendency, but because if you cannot face the reality of what you're doing, you should not be part of that process. These are deeply thinking human beings. He contrasted it with his experience as a fast jet pilot. And just think about it in practical terms. Flying in 400 miles an hour, and you have to actually sit in one to know what 400 miles an hour feels like. You've got four, five, six seconds as you're coming over the horizon to find your target, lock on, release your target, and then you leave at 400 odd miles an hour as well. You don't see the human being, the children, the family, the social setup. You are in and out. And these guys, many of them are ex-fighter and bomber pilots. And they can contrast before and afterwards. This, to them, puts them far closer emotionally, psychologically, than being in a fast jet just a few hundred <coughs> or thousand feet above the action that's going on. It's counterintuitive. But that's what you find out when you actually speak to the people who do it. Consequences of misuse, because it's all right saying there are ethical uses of it, but the majority of what's been done, certainly in, in Pakistan, does not conform to anything I would call ethics. Increasing mistrust, political and military. There's the, the picture of Hakimula I just downloaded yesterday. US kills Hakimula and kills the peace talks. It is a barrier to peace. It's counterproductive in that some of the many positive uses of this technology, which I reeled off at the beginning, 
and indeed protection of Allied soldiers, which I think is a very legitimate thing to do, could be stopped because of the, the public um, response to abuses. Pub and as soon as the public says, you may not have this bit of kit in the Royal Air Force in the United Kingdom inventory, that's it, game over. Any advantages are gone. Um, and yes, the disadvantages do need dealt with. I, I put that on and it caught my attention. I don't always order drone strikes against children, but when I do, I make sure I'm wearing my Nobel Peace Prize. I just thought there was something um, very hubristic about that. And that's pretty much all I'm going to say just now, but whatever questions you've got in a little while, I'll be very happy to answer them. But I think we're going to listen to Noel next. Thank you very much. The X-47B has been designed for you support Nimitz platform. Well, that's pretty much my view, but we're talking here about autonomous weapons, which I will be going into. But let me just give you a little video of the drones, because... Can we have the lights again? Because we were talking about drones there, but I just want to let you see what, what the kind of what the kind of action is. This is a predator drone. They were first used by the CIA in 2001. They're the people responsible for arming them, in fact. And this you'll see it out here on a, on a mission. So it's got two Hellfire missiles. Oh. And that's the kind of thing I, I, it does. Now, like my colleague here, I think you really need to separate the use by <coughs> conventional forces from the use by the CIA. Because essentially the CIA are a load of killing bastards, and, the, and you should not be giving them an air force. I mean, that's essentially what 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 it amounts to. Uh, so they were killing anyway, but now they've got better tools for doing it, and there's a lot of this targeted killing. But I'm not exactly a fan of drones either, because although my colleague here said that uh, they're much better than the B-52, I actually had a, I do have conversations with the CIA. I had a conversation with the CIA, and I put it to them that at least they're more accurate than B-52s. And they said to me, you don't seem to understand we could not be flying B-52s over Africa or over Pakistan because it would not be acceptable to the international community. So something about this idea of a drone being really precise, a really precise tool that makes it acceptable to use in other circumstances. Um, and I think that it does expand the battle space greatly. And it's really stupid. Even the conventional use is a bit odd because it means that the President of the United States, without approval, can Congress can use these. And he used them in Libya. And the normal rule in the United States is called the War Powers Resolution. And the idea is that after 60 days, a President can commit forces to war, but after 60 days, he must go and get congressional approval. He committed drones to Libya and didn't go for congressional approval. Some people in Congress complained. And Harold Coe, his top lawyer, said, well, there were no forces committed, so we don't need to come back to Congress. And Congress accepted it. And what that means is the United States president can fly drones whenever he wants to, anywhere he wants, without congressional approval, whether it be the, be the CIA or the conventional forces. And another thing I have to say is that uh, in talking to a lot of senior military in the United States, there are a lot of complaints about the RAF's use of drones, in fact. Uh, which makes me happier with the RAF. Uh, not the aggressive enough. <laughs> not ca too cautious. Yeah. Spend too long hovering and looking when they've had direct orders to kill. They don't do it. They hover and look. And many times they pull away and get told off for it when they find it's the wrong target. And also the whole idea of the distance killing. This is something I bought into. I've even written a paper called From Joysticks to Politics, Killing Made Easy, uh, where I talk about the buffer of distance. But recently, uh, a wide survey in the United States and a number of young pilots coming forward talking about the trauma they've suffered. There's the Confessions of a Drone Pilot, if you want to look it up in the, uh, on the internet, which came out last week from a US, young US guy who, he didn't know what he was doing. He thought he was joining as an image analyst and he ended up sitting, a 21-year-old ended up sitting in one of these pods killing people. Um, he couldn't see the targets properly. He was a sensor operator, and he quite often, one, in one instance he talks about, he saw a child, and he was told from the command up above, that's, not, that's a dog, it's not a child. He never believed them it was a dog. There was no analysis of it, no reporting of what he said, and he's totally traumatized and, and see, you know, getting psychiatric care. He had to leave the forces. And again, there's a confessions from a young British pilot doing the same thing recently. So, so you, 
I'm not sure about that now. It was a nice, it's a nice narrative to say they're buffered from the killing, but I, I'm, I have to be fair. I'm a scientist, I have to be fair. Okay. So this is the guys here. They sit 7,000 miles away at Creech Air Force Base. This is conventional guys. You've got a pilot here <coughs> who actually controls the plane and presses the button to send the missile, the Hellfire missile. But this guy's job, the other guy, you can't really quite see there, he's the sensor or the sensor operator. And what he's doing is he's got a laser designator and he's shining a laser designator on the target so the missile will hit the laser, well, the laser points. He can though, and I say he, but uh, again, uh, quite often females, very often females in, in these roles, uh, but the sensor operator can move the laser any time they want and make the missile go somewhere else before it hits hits the ground, hits the target. And so, you know, that that's their job. And that, that's what the guy who was uh, suffering from trauma that talked about it was, was doing. I don't feel terribly sorry for them, though, because if you commit yourself to war, you know, you're going to suffer trauma. And that sh to me, that shows our humanity and our dislike of killing as people. So if soldiers suffer from trauma, you probably don't know this, but as many, almost twice as many uh, s soldiers, military, who have served in Afghanistan and Iraq have actually committed suicide than were killed in the actual war subsequently. So young people do suffer from these conflicts, and that's a good thing. So my, one of my big worries as well, which addresses you, uh, is the proliferation. This is China, Turkey, the neuron Saab. This is Polish. This is Chinese. This is Russian. These are Pakistani. This is Israeli. These are all drones. Uh, I've tracked personally 77 countries that now have the technology. Not many of them are armed yet, but some are. Um, this one is. This is from Iran. It's called the Karar, and it carries two cruise missiles. Um, and we don't know if it works very well or not, but Iran are well into development now. They have 17 drones, many of them armed. And here's one of them here, which looks like a Reaper drone, but much prettier with the nicer wheelbase, I think, than, than the Reaper. Um, now, and you might know this or might not, but uh, last year, there's a, there's a drone called the uh, Sentinel. It's a stealth drone, very stealthy. The US have been using, it's their most advanced piece of technology that they have. It's the most advanced drone in the world. And I, I haven't even seen a picture of it. I mean, I read the defense news every day. I couldn't find any videos of it until I saw this one on YouTube. The Iranians brought it down. We don't know how they brought it down. They might have used spoofing. One of the things about drones as well is that if you send a stronger GPS signal from the ground than it can receive from a satellite, you can make it think, and th I'm using think in a very loose sense here, you can make it think it's somewhere that it isn't. Uh, the Iranians are claiming they spoofed this to the ground. I think it's unlikely, but they might have used other electronic uh, techniques. They now say they've copied it. President Obama asked for it back straight afterwards, said, can we have our drone back, when he finally admitted uh, it was there. And they sent him a toy pink one. <laughs> so they have a sense of humor at least. Um, I have actually seen a copy of this. It was a journalist gave it to me and unfortunately had my laptop stolen straight afterwards and I've lost the bloody photograph. It's from a telephoto lens of a copy of this uh, Sentinel on a Chinese airport. So, it's, so the big worry here is proliferation, everybody getting it. It's not just us having it. And it's particularly blinkered approach in the United States when they're attacking countries that they're not even at war with, what will other people do? Now, earlier this year, China, for instance, were after a guy in Myanmar, what we used to call Burma. Uh, and he had killed, he was a nasty guy. He was a drugs baron. He had killed 13 Chinese sailors. And they wanted to get him, but he was up in the mountains. And they were going to use a drone to, to, sh to kill him. And that would have been the China going into another country that they weren't at war with to use a drone to kill somebody. But fortunately, I think it was fortunately, they caught him on the border uh, just before they used the drone and they tried him and executed him within a few days. But so these things could expand everywhere. Now, and they, they're, they're also, there's also a worry about how they might disrupt world security because people are using them. For instance, the United States are using them in Iran and uh, Iran keep launching jets every time they approach the Iranian border. And now, and this is ridiculous, every single US drone near Iran is accompanied by two fighter jets. So talk about unmanned saving money. Um, there's been a dispute recently, and it's only surveillance. Uh, Japan, 
launched fighter jets against Chinese drones over disputed islands in the Pacific last week, the week before, and uh, time passes so quickly. And um, the Chinese have said if they shoot down any Chinese drones, they will treat it as an act of warfare. So these things are, are even for surveillance purposes, are a bit risky and a bit dangerous up there, I think. But that's not what I want to talk to you about today. These are really like the, the Model T Ford, as it were, of what's coming. And I'll show you another look at this X-47B without somebody stamping on it. No, I won't show you the Chinese. Uh, Chinese Juhei Air Show, there were 22 models of drones. That's right, this is important to tell you. Um, now, this is, from a, this is a quote from the main designer for the uh, <coughs> military in China. The United States doesn't export many attack drones. That's armed ones. We export plenty of uh, surveillance ones. So we're taking advantage of that hole in the market. So China are saying they're going to sell, it more, sell them more widely, the armed ones. Now, arming them isn't that simple if you want to be accurate because you've got the whole firing mechanism with the, with the you know, laser scanning and things, but it's not rocket science. Everybody will have these. Everybody will have them eventually. It's a bit of a worry. Meet the X-47B, the technological dream machine that is the future of U.S. Navy unmanned aviation. The X-47B has been designed for use aboard Nimitz-class aircraft carriers. Its tailless batwing shape will make it the stealthiest unmanned system ever to take to the skies. So these are fast subsonic, just beneath the speed of sound. Uh, they've got faster ones. And that is fully autonomous, so it operates without anybody in the loop at all, without a person, what was it you called, unmanned person? Uh, remotely piloted. All oh, right, it's not remotely <coughs> piloted, it flies without anybody in the loop. And the big worry is, will it be used without any human control on the weapon system? Now, if I've been reading the US documents since 2003, and all of the roadmaps, all of the plans are pushing towards autonomy, taking people out of the loop. There's a number <coughs> of reasons for this. The guys there sitting at Creech Air Force Base, when you, move, when you move that joystick, it takes a second and a half minimum, up to four seconds, to actually move the motor on the craft. You imagine playing a game, a video game with somebody, where there, you, you've, every time you move the joystick, it takes a second and a half to four seconds for your player to move on the video game. It's not going to be very useful. And that's just the way it is, because they, don't, they can't reach a satellite in the United States over Iraq or Iran, so they have to send the signal through normal phone wire, not normal phone wire, it's pretty advanced broadband, but they send the signal to Europe, then it gets beamed up from a satellite from there, so that's what takes the time, from the electronics. So the United States talk also about the idea of a permissive airspace, so drones can only be used in a permissive airspace, because the, the trouble with the drones is that they're very slow. The current ones are slow. They're not fast subsonic. It's not so easy to deal with a fast subsonic if you're a remote control pilot, I can tell you. But one of the biggest worries is the notion of uh, the United States talks about um, signal jamming. So if communications are broken, what are you going to do with your drone? What they say is, and they mean Russia or China, essentially, they say if we're fighting a more sophisticated en enemy, the first thing they're going to do is jam the communication signals. So then later on in paragraphs, in the next couple of pages later, they talk about but having control of the weapon. But I don't know how you're going to communicate with the weapon if your signals are jammed. So that doesn't make any sense to me. I think it's nonsense. Now, it's not just the United States developing autonomous weapons. It's also the UK, BAE Systems. I'm going to show you a cartoon version of the aircraft. Stealthy combat aircraft, which can think for itself. Now what she said there, which, which can think for itself, that's BAE Systems and their advert. Um, don't ever be fooled by that. There's no thinking involved here. You've got a fairly simple computer system here that does not think. And it's quite a nice thing to make people believe, there's, and I'm a professor of artificial intelligence, it's a nice thing to believe that there's advanced artificial intelligence in these and there will be in the next 10 years and they're going to be thinking. They won't be. What we've got at the moment is something called automatic target recognition. It recognises some shapes. You might be able to recognise a tank in a desert. You can recognise a ship in an empty sea. But actually recognising a tank against trees is pretty impossible at the moment. You've also got heat detection. That's another method of automatic target recognition. But you don't walk around, you know, say, oh, there's, there's, a, there's a person, there's a, there's a dog or something like that. It's not easy. 
Okay, now just to show you, I'm not just going to talk about air, though that's what we're supposed to be talking about, but just to give you an idea of the power of these things. That little thing there, which is a wonderful little, it saves a lot of lives, it's for bomb disposal, it's EOD detection. And it's got a water disrupting cannon there, so it looks under car, you remote control it, looks under cars, and you use that. Now these things get repurposed, I just want to show you the power of this. This is about, I'd say, it, I, I know it well, it's about that size. It's quite a small thing. But I just want to show you what it's capable of if you repurpose it. You'll notice here's another one. It's a little thing again, but it's got a little black box, uh, well, quite a big black box on top of it. That's supposed to be for mine clearance. Yes, indeed. It'll never be used for anything else, will it? Okay. So, this is a fully autonomous version, because those little things, you know, you can trap them, you can trick them. They sent a few armed ones to, the, uh, to Iraq, and the special forces in Iraq called them TRVs, which is, called, which is short for Taliban Resupply Vehicle, because they just kicked them over and took the machine guns off them. <laughs> and Kinetic, who make them, told me uh, that this was nonsense, because they put a padlock on them. <laughs> so, the, so you need something bigger. This is a seven-ton one, fully autonomous, that grew out of the DARPA Grand Challenge. And you can see, uh, the Army teamed up with the Defense Advanced Research Project. This is a Cadillac that's going to crush. That's a very powerful thing. Again, fully autonomous capability. No person look. That's the Guardian Israel, which is fully autonomous. There's a lot more of these. There's also, you know, there's there's ones being deployed in, in America as well. Uh, sorry, Korea as well. Now, a little bit about you did a good job for me there. A little bit in international humanitarian law. Now you've got the humanitarians on one side and the necessitarians on the other. That's people who humanitarians essentially <coughs> don't want any civilians to be killed whatsoever, ever. Necessitarians think, you know, military, you really, the main focus is, is military. Now I'm characterizing them here, and necessitarians get very, very annoyed with me for showing it as a tug of war because they say there's a lot of shades of grey in there, but, you know, saw them. Um, so the laws of war, use and bellow, and the main principles which Peter pointed out to you uh, earlier are principle of discrimination, distinction, principle of proportionality, and it's also very, very important in warfare to have accountability for any kind of mishap or war crime. This is, this is essential, especially within the military. Now, the principle of distinction, as Peter said, is that you must, weapon, you must, with any weapon, you must be able to discriminate between a, a legal target and a non-legal target. In other words, between a civilian and a military target, or between even a wounded soldier, a surrendering soldier, a vicar, you know, mentally ill soldier, those things you must you must discriminate, have, be able to discriminate. And the problem with this, with autonomous weapon systems, is there's no way they can discriminate. They couldn't discriminate between a child pointing an ice cream cone at you and a, and a soldier with a weapon. They could use a metal detector. Difficult. So when I first heard about this, my sort of nightmare was thinking about. You can imagine a scenario of a child running into the street with a toy gun or a stick. And the mother really screaming at the child, you know, stop, stop, don't go there. Soldier sees that, would work out what was going on. Robot sees that, blood and guts over the, over the ground. I mean, there's no question of that. They just cannot do discrimination. I mean, there's, there's, there's a most recent development which was paid for in America by our Ministry of Defence, which I just found out about accidentally. It was secret, but I was at a, a defence meeting in the United States and the contractor said about it because he thought everybody there was American citizens who were also... I was the only person with a big badge saying foreigner must not be left alone on it. I kept it. <laughs> uh, so he said about this, our home office have worked on these human detectors. So you can detect a human from a car. Uh, but when I questioned the guy, you can't tell a human from a statue, a dancing bear, or a dog standing on its legs. Okay, That's the kind of stage we're at. So the idea of using autonomous weapons is quite odious. And the principle of proportionality essentially, and I'm going to put it more bluntly than you did, means that you can kill civilians providing it's directly proportional to military advantage. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's more blunt than you put that's it. That's the Geneva Convention. It. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we don't say killing civilians. But, uh, so the idea there is that 
how could a robot be proportionate? Proportionality is very, very difficult. I mean, nobody gets it right, particularly, but it takes a really, really uh, experienced commander who will make that decision, you know, because you don't know it, and it can change from one, one day to the next. It's very contextually sensitive. It requires human judgment to do this. Now, there's some people who argue that a robot could be more proportionate because there's this horrible, well, it's good software in a sense, that the United States use called bug splat. And what bug splat does is it, um, it will calculate the best weapon to use. So you have a 3D map, you paint the target on the map, and it will calculate the best weapon to use to minimize the collateral damage. Okay? So, and it will minim talk to, it'll also tell you the angle to use it, providing you have a 3D map. So people say, well, a robot, therefore, could be more proportionate. But that's the easy <coughs> proportionality problem. The hard one is deciding whether it's worth it or not. Because supposing the target was next to a school, it was one guy who was a foot soldier, kind of Al-Qaeda foot soldier. He's, in a, he's next to a school, now, and there's a thousand kids in the school. Now what Bug, bug Splat might do is tell you, here's a weapon, here's the best rocket to use for this purpose. So you'll only kill 50 children rather than 200. But the decision whether it's worth killing any children for the sake of that one target must be human. And that's one of the things we're arguing about. And that human can be held accountable. You cannot hold a robot accountable. And what worries a lot of military commanders that I meet is that they don't like autonomous weapons at all because they say, I know who's going to be held accountable. It's going to be me. And I don't want to be held accountable because it can take a bullet. There could be a software fault. There could be mud in the sensors. And there's a whole long list of manufacturers and, and different people involved in this. And it could be just, you know, what the computers are like. And they use, I mean, certainly the drones are flown with uh, Vista. Microsoft Vista, which crashes quite a lot, so you know, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust that one bit. I must move on a bit. Sorry. So what are we doing about this? Well, NGO plot began in, uh, well, I mean, the International Committee for Robot Arms Control was formed because of these issues in 2009, I believe. And Steve Wright here's a member. He from Leeds Met. He joined 2010. And um, we've been protesting about the autonomous drones. All we were trying to do was trying to get international discussion. But we're a bunch of professors, so you know, what what can we what can we uh, what can we do? But we wrote a lot of journal articles, a lot of papers, gave an awful lot of talks and stuff. And uh, Human Rights Watch, a big human rights organisation, the biggest in the world, came to see me in February 2012 to talk to me about it. And then we had a meeting in New York with this group of people. You've got here. Uh, that's Human Rights Watch, Ivan Pax Christie, Article 36, Harvard Law Clinic, that's Judy Williamson, she's the Nobel Peace, Women's Peace Initiative, Pugwash, another Nobel Peace Prize winning uh, group, um, and, and some other, and me there, and some others. And we decided at that point that we'd start a campaign to stop killer robots. It wasn't my choice of a title, it's a bit poppy for me. I like autonomous weapons. Autonomous weapons essentially are weapons that once launched, will select their own targets and engage them or kill them without further human intervention. It's the selection of the targets. It's delegating that decision to machines the problem. So we met then. Human Rights Watch produced a report in um, April last year. And three days later, the Department of Defense very kindly, because people were saying this is science fiction, they very kindly produced a directive explaining how they would treat autonomous weapons. Okay? So, that, so they admitted that they were actually doing it and they gave a research, green light to research, although they said they would always try to either maintain a human in the loop or else never use it against the laws of war because we know the United States never ever break the laws of war, so we're okay there. And what they did was they repeatedly emphasized verification and testing. Now, if you're a computer scientist like me, you'll know that verification is almost impossible for any program. It's very, very difficult to guarantee a program, unless it's a very small, simple one. But what they're, they keep saying, they're going to test them against failures. They're going to minimize failures. And it's not till you get to page 14, the very bottom in the glossary, you find out what the failures are. Human error, human machine interaction failures, malfunctions, communication degradation, software coding errors. You can't, you can't really minimize these things at all, but it gets worse. 
infiltration into the industrial supply chain, which I could talk about because that has actually happened quite a lot, jamming, spoofing, decoys. But the best one of all for me is that what they're going to minimize is other enemy countermeasures or actions, unanticipated situations on the battlefield. Now, if anybody here can tell me how you minimize something that's unanticipated, I'd like to know what, 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 how you go about doing that. It's crazy. I'm nearly finished. So in April this year, we launched the campaign to stop killer robots from, the, um, from Parliament. And it's been very, very successful. It's gone much faster than you could possibly imagine, in fact. Um, Christoph Haynes, who I advised as well, produced a report for the uh, UN Human Rights Council in May 2013, asking for a complete moratorium worldwide on these weapons. So a moratorium while we think and get international discussion going. That's not sufficient for me. If we look at air power, there was talk about air power over and over again from about 1909 onwards. Even in 1939, there was a United Nations, uh, sorry, what was it called? The League of Nations resolution on it, but no legally binding agreement. And look where that's led us now. The nations were against using air, air bombardment. They said there's already law in place from siege bombardment, etc. so we don't need new laws. That's always the talk. But we didn't <coughs> need new laws because we've gone that route. I don't like aerial bombardment. Well, nobody does, really, do they? So that was uh, Christoph Haynes. Now, since then, um, we've, had, we've been to some UN meetings, and eight, 30 nations now, including the US, have spoken up about the use of autonomous weapons in the UN. So we've actually met our goal of getting international discussion going. But we want to take it further. Now, one way of doing this, we actually want a new treaty, is what we're asking for, a legally binding treaty. It's 44 NGOs at the minute from 21 countries. And the other w another method, which tends to be a bit slow, and we didn't really want it, but it can be very useful, is the CCW, which is uh, also a committee on the United Nations. I'm coming up to an end. Uh, so it's a co convention on the prohibition restrictions of certain weapons, and that's where chemical, biological weapons and blinding lasers are are banned. So the CCW in the UN can ban weapons. This is this is in the Geneva Convention. So uh, the French have taken over presidency now of the CCW committee, and we had a meeting, that's me, with the French ambassador, who's the head, who's now the president of the CCW, and he agreed to take it forward to the CCW, but we were very concerned about people blocking it, such as the United States. Uh, <laughs> the United States are supporting a mandate uh, to the CCW to discuss this. And discussion means funding, it means they'll set up a high-level committee of diplomats and they will discuss the issues. They will know what the outcome is. I'm going back to the UN again on the 15th of November to talk, and we'll know what the, uh, the 13th, and we'll know what the outcome is on the 15th. So we're hoping for a mandate there that will take that forward. Now, just that's my grandchildren. I always like to show them my slides. <laughs> but it's a, it's a sort of concluding thing. Um, these, are, these are the people I'm really worried about. These are the ones who are going to face these autonomous weapons really. Uh, and children, I've just been talking at War Child, which is why I'm wearing my War Child badge, and one of the, the greatest victims, really, to me, it's just an absolute sin to me to kill children. And quite often I hear when, when we're talking about drones or whatever, people in the audience, especially you know, serving military, different people have this sort of cliched thing that protects them, distances them morally, when I talk about killing of children, and they say things like, well, you know, that's the nature of war, it always has been, it always will be, you know, children, that's just the way war is. Well, just because it always has been doesn't mean it's right, and we should really take extra care about the killing of children. A lot of children have died in drone strikes, and it's just not right. But big, why I've used their slide is to say that, you know, the UK, the UK government are saying now, we're developing autonomous weapons, but we assure you there'll always be a human in the, in, involved in the control of them somewhere. But the big question now is, what do they mean? What is meaningful human control? The Patriot missile system, for instance, give you a 10 second veto, <coughs> window of veto. So we'll tell you, here's a target, you have 10 seconds, ah, you know, you don't veto it. Uh, that's why a, a, U, a UK tornado and two fighter jets from the United States were shot down <coughs> with it. So we have to be very clear about what we mean by human control and human involvement. And we want to see that put into Article 36 for the UK so it actually becomes part of weapons reviews and a very clear idea of what it is. But the thing about it is, is our government can say whatever they want, the US government can say whatever they want, 
But these guys, I mean, they're, they're growing up, and every four or five years in a democracy, which we still have, regardless of Russell Bland <coughs> or Brand, um, is that we change government. And these are legacy systems. So one government might be, oh, we won't use these, but another government gets them. I'm worried about massive proliferation, so we'll be forced to use them, and we've got to stop them now. So my last word to you, the last three words, is stop killer robots. Sovereign airspace. Why, how do drones RPAS get around the laws of sovereign airspace? Um, you're explaining the question. Yeah. <laughs> I'm assuming. I'm assuming that um, under Article Two, of the United Nations, which talks about um, every country, every state. I call it. I call it the Catholic choir boy syndrome, where every state has got the right to non-interference, um, and the. So that means. Geo, geo, yes, I'm going to thank you. You're a Catholic choir boy. Um, so, so, um, that's either geographically on the ground or interfering in our sovereign airspace. So everything above the United Kingdom, right up to space, is British sovereign airspace. I'm assuming that's what they mean. How do drones get around it? Well, frankly, you don't. They're just an aircraft. You fly, they fly in airspace. One of the reasons that the UK does not allow Reaper or any other large remotely piloted aircraft to fly in our airspace is because it doesn't fit the Civil Aviation Authority guidelines. So these are only used in places, to use your word, permissive. Um, so in Pakistan, one of the controversies there, or let's start Afghanistan. At the moment, the United States Air Force and the Royal Air Force have got permission from the Afghan government, well, we can have a whole conversation about the legitimacy of that, but they've got permission to operate under NATO rules in Afghanistan. The Pakistan question is an interesting one because it appears that the CIA are flying willy-nilly in someone else's sovereign airspace. Therefore, it would be illegal. But we, we regularly hear things slipping out into public domain that actually the Pakistan government is quite happy for the CIA to be killing its enemies in North Pakistan and the Taliban. <coughs> So there's a tacit agreement, and we, I can't prove this, but my feeling this is probably about right, that there's a tacit approval from the Pakistan government to the United States saying, yeah, you can do that, as long as you don't go too far. And then in the meantime, we're going to call you names, but you just, you just don't, don't show that we're part of this. So I can only conclude that, that regarding the use of um, drones in Pakistan, that there is some degree of collusion between the Americans or the Pakistan government, or um, the Pakistan government deems it worth the humiliation to achieve some of its ends, which are to kill pa uh, Taliban leaders in northern <coughs> Pakistan. Just, just on well, just, yeah, will do. Just on that point, there was there was definitely tacit agreement, yeah. but there isn't now. No, no, it hasn't been for some time, yeah, and, yeah. and they're still doing it. I think Bin Laden put an end. But one of the things that always puzzled me, apart, and I'll, I'll speak about the, you know, why, why they can do it in sovereign airspace. But one of the things that's always struck me is that we can't fly them in the UK, we can't fly them in the US because we're worried about them crashing and falling on people's heads. But we fly them across Africa without asking permission to Mali and to Somalia. And we just fly them in other people's airspace when we feel like it, really. So it's a bit odd. But how can how can they fly into Africa? How can they fly into Mali and make it legal? I think that was the question, was it? How um, it legal? says, how do drones get around the laws oh, yeah, of sovereign airspace? Well, one of the reasons one of the reasons why you can do it, and what Harold Cole, the chief lawyer in the United States for Obama, says, he uses something called Article 51 from the Geneva Convention, mm -hmm. which essentially says that. You can um, you can kill anyone who's a direct threat to your nation. So they would say that some some guy loading a gun onto a truck in Somalia or Mali was a direct threat to the United States, an imminent threat to the United States. It has to be, which is totally nonsense. But when you've got a big country with all, with more with 51 percent of the world's weapons, nobody's arguing, and that's why they can do it essentially. But they shouldn't really be doing it. And also there was, sorry, so I don't want to get into this too much, but when George Bush, and we all thought he was an idiot, well he was an idiot, <laughs> but we thought he was an idiot for this idea of a war on terror. And that wasn't such a stupid thing at all, because I've looked at the White House documents, by declaring a war on terror, he was 
moving from international humanitarian law to international, sorry, he was moving from international human rights law to international humanitarian law. So he said Al Qaeda were armed combatants. They were, um, they could be treated as soldiers without prisoner of war privileges because they don't wear uniforms. So his war and terror meant they were combatants, so that's international humanitarian law. Now one of the big differences between international humanitarian law and international human rights law is that under international humanitarian law they're killing Al-Qaeda leaders and calling them soldiers and they're, they're getting collateral damage around it. Now under international human rights law that's called murder. Okay. And there is no such a thing as collateral damage. When the police come, to, when somebody's got hostages and the police arrive, they don't bomb the building and say that's collateral damage. Sorry, we killed a few civilians with it. So that's one of the big problems with this. Wasn't Thank quite you. your question. Thank you. so, uh, interesting. Um, I've got a question from Oliver Wilson. Do you want to say your question or shall I read it out? Oh, I'll clarify it as well. Um, you can read it out as well, but I'll clarify it. Okay. Um, basically, because of the amount of uh, civilian deaths that are getting killed, uh, I recently watched Jeremy Scales' Dirty Wars, if anyone's familiar with that. The world is a battlefield. Um, he's basically saying that the blowback will get back from the ones who want the revenge. Rightfully will want the revenge, because I would if I had my family killed by a drone. Will we be creating more terrorists by using these drones like this? Um, is it... Yeah. I'll speak first on that. Yes, I've read It's Dirty Wars, it's yeah. the, the subtitle you gave. I'm actually going to meet him next week. Um, it does seem, the thing is, it's very difficult to assemble evidence of these things at all. But it looks like in Africa, for instance, before the Ethiopian army were recruited to go into, was it Somalia or the Yemen? I can't remember which. I think it might have been Somalia. So the CIA recruited the Ethiopian army and sent them in to kill. And there were something like something like 40 known terrorists there at the time and so that increased dramatically to hundreds once the drone strikes started it increased to thousands so it looks as if the drone strikes are actually increasing terrorism people in Pakistan there's a guy called uh, General McChrystal who was head of special forces he was JSOC joint you know, Scattered special Talks operations Talks. command yeah. that's it he was head of that and so he wasn't really an ethical man but he was a very pragmatic man and when he took control, unfortunately he got sacked in the end, but when he took control he said, every time we kill one single innocent person, ten more people join the Taliban or join the Al-Qaeda. So killing innocent people, even if it's collateral, families don't like it. But unfortunately McChrystal said some things about uh, President Obama to Rolling Stone off the record and they published it and then he got sacked. That was the excuse anyway. I'll pick up with another stat. Um, Stanley McChrystal quote that I use in some of my lectures and he said air power can win us this thing but air power can lose us this thing because of the, the collateral damage and recruiting more enemy. Is it counterproductive? Absolutely yes and it's not just in that area. If you think about Afghanistan where, where we the British have been defeated three times in the last couple of hundred years already and, and aiming to call the fourth defeat by some other name, but it will be what's regularly known as an ass-kicking where I come from. Um, we, we, are, we are about to crawl out with our tail between our legs, call it some kind of victory, and then, then the Afghans will, will do their own thing. But when friends of mine engage with Afghan leaders on a regular basis out in the, in the shuras and whatnot, um, there's a saying in the military, in the British military, is or, or the, the Afghans talk about, you've got the watches, but we've got the time. And you have old Afghan men talking about when their great, 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 great grandfather or uncle beat the British in 1851. Because that's the kind of periods that they think about. So in terms of cycles of vengeance and, and, and so on, if someone came to my country and do it, I, I, would, um, I would take exactly the same attitude. And they're, they're storing, I think the Americans in particular, but we are allied to them, so it, it affects us. Uh, the Americans in particular are storing up a generational problem, not something that's going to happen for five or ten years, something that they'll be talking about for 100, 200 years. Uh, and, and if they want to start engaging positively around the world, they're, they're starting way, they're putting themselves further back from where they, they need to be because of the political policies. Thank you.
Steve, you got a question? Uh, uh, sorry, I got this wrong. I was thinking of Braveheart there. I can't study English. Um, <laughs> just on the same theme, uh, Jamal Malik, uh, in, in relation to how um, counterproductive um, ire is uh, directed often at the own government, off you go. Yeah. So it's uh, yeah, now loads of innocent people obviously get killed with their drones. So I was just wondering, now, uh, is it not counterproductive? Sorry, is it me? Now, loads of innocent people actually go and join the Taliban uh, and obviously fight. I think you just answered my question. I meant for anyway. So, and obviously they relate to uh, the governments of the country that they're helping the Americans. <coughs> And obviously, they kind of uh, go and attack the security forces of their government. So, I think you asked my question this before the answer. So. Well, there is a point there that I, I spoke to, I talked, I made friends with the Deputy Chief of Staff of uh, Pakistan, and I heard him telling the United States off at a, I mean, it was a general's meeting, so it was all generals. <coughs> and he was telling the uh, head of the Judge Advocate General's Office in, Af in uh, Afghanistan of, about, you know, what did you think would happen when you came in anger? and chased the Taliban out of office. What did you think would happen? And what he did was he did a flyover. He showed us a flyover over the border between Afghanistan and Iraq. And there was something like 24,000 routes through the border. It's unstoppable. So he said, what do you think was going to happen? And he said that we're caught in a, between a rock and a hard place. Either we're helping the infidel or else we're helping terrorists. And so we've got no place to go. And he put the, he put the blame directly on the United States for doing it. Can I just say, our when I was in the Air Force about 10 years ago, I was based at RAF Cottesmore where the Harriers were. And at that time, I got to know Sheikh Ibrahim Mogra, who's on the Muslim Council of Britain. And we got to talking about this. This is 2003, 2004. And we got to talking, and he was doing a, uh, involved in a lot, an imam from Leicester, involved in the education of Muslim um, young men and women in Leicester. And he arranged to bring a whole group to the Air Force Base at Cottesmore. And I was intrigued that, that he wanted to do this. And, and he said, well, Pete, it's like this. He said, people in the military are worried that, that, that they might be attacked by a suicide bomber and they might get hit. He said, but if my son gets radicalized, he will definitely die because he'll have explosives around his waist. So I, I still wrestle with that. I still, I still, I see him on television regularly, and 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 I think within the UK, we have to acknowledge with the death of drummer Rigby earlier this year, that w was that a direct result of the UK and the US involvement around the world? I find it hard to come to any other conclusion. Thanks. I, I just point out we've got about ten minutes in order to try and we have to wrap up a bit early so they can get ready for the next session here. No, I think we can cover these. I think okay. Uh, Dan Clayton had a question about uh, moral superiority. Yeah. Does the discussion about the ethical or most civilised way to kill reflect the fact that the Western authorities are fighting wars more to prove their moral superiority and to feel good about themselves uh, rather than any, any, any serious strategic or economic objectives? I, I don't think so. I, I think that there's... I did know that somebody who somebody wrote a PhD thesis looking at the language that Blair and Bush used, uh, the religious language that they both used, crusade language and stuff. But I really think it's I think it's largely to do with economic advantage. Myself, that's my own view. I'll keep it short because we want to get through all the questions. I think there's an economic side. Um, Blair and Bush definitely had, and to some extent, still have this sense of moral superiority. And, and Blair, his language is now, now about Iran. We have to do something. Well, what? Make things worse, like you did before. And there is a sense of innate superiority. Our, our way of looking at the world, Now I'm lucky that I grew up in Malaysia for a number of years, a Muslim country, in Zambia in my 20s. Um, so I've seen a little bits of the world and see how to use a Robert Burns, Scottish poet, to use a Robert Burns saying, to look at yourself how others see you. And actually how others mm -hmm. see we British and Western, Westerners from other continents is a pretty ugly thing, actually. And I think we're just exacerbating that at a time where we should be doing far more in terms of encouraging other struggling countries' economies to develop instead of you know, exporting a lot of violence, which we seem to be doing. I'll just read this one out from Joshua Whitehead. Um, to what extent does the nature of the opposition or threat 
necessitate the use of unmanned drones? I guess that's maybe it's a question about proportionality or association. I think the nature of the opposition almost makes the unmanned drones unusable. So if you've got a, a suicide bomber in the middle of Kabul, there is nothing that the best unmanned drone can do about that. Because if you're in an occupied place, you use the drone, you're going to kill loads of civilians. Um, and so as for all the autonomous stuff as well, no matter how high tech the West goes, you will never, ever defeat a highly motivated enemy who's, compared, who's prepared to lose their own life in pursuit of their objectives. So, you know, I think, I think they're almost a waste of time use, using, using them um, in the majority of cases with force. Intelligence can be good, but actually killing from them can be a waste of time. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Well, we just I, want to get to I'll give you that to read out, Dave. It's from Run to Adamology, and it's about something must be done. What? Uh, okay, I'll read it out. As, as much as I agree with that we need to minimize the use of killer drone robots, what do you sorry, think the alternatives for containing the spread of extreme terrorists in something or other, I can't read, you, Pakistan, uh, Pakistan etc. Yeah. So I guess that's the question. Yeah. What, what's the alternative? For me, the alternative is to kill them with kindness myself. And unfortunately, it might take a couple of generations now, and I keep uh, uh, nagging Israelis about this. Instead of you spending all this money on a lot of high-tech weaponry to go and kill them all the time in Palestine, why don't they give them schools and hospitals? And they keep saying to me, well, we tried that. Well, they might have tried it for five minutes, but you might have to try it for two generations, because eventually the, the kids in Palestine will say, what have you got against these guys? Look at all they've given us. We've got, we're all at, we've got universities, we've got schools, we've got hospitals. And I don't think that continually killing people is going to solve it. It certainly is not. There's no, well, there's another way. The alternative is you can either be very kind to them, try and change it that way, or you can kill all of them. So the other alternative is we use nuclear weapons and just zap them. I mean, that would, that would do it. Let's just destroy oh. Afghanistan and Iraq and Iran. Then we'd have no oil, of course. Oh. <laughs> okay. I've run out of questions. Maybe she would oh. give everyone a million pounds each, unless anyone's going to ask one. I'd ask the question myself. I was wondering about the last question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in regards to trying to minimize the use of um, robots, killing weapons and all that, I'm of the opinion that considering we're <coughs> in another part of Nigeria and Somalia and in Mali, that there's also the need to understand the fact that some of these countries should also play their role in having the capacity to deal with this crisis too. Beyond just, yeah, I agree the West also based on the legacy of colonialism and all that. Uh, and that is what's been to what's going on in all these countries like Afghanistan and Iraq and Iran and all that. Yeah, but beyond that, these countries also have to play their own role in having the capacity to deal with this crisis too. And the narratives of the religious narratives in regards to this idea of the end of the world and the need to have to spread um, what is the Islamization? Because in Nigeria, for example, the problem is those in another part of the country want an Islamic country, an Islamic Nigeria, and that is not possible. It's not about what the West is doing, it's not about what the West is doing in the Middle East, it's about the narrative when it comes to religion itself. And, that, and a lot of these countries are breeding grounds for terrorists. So, what do you think is the alternative beyond just reducing? Because not, if that's what happened in Pakistan, we can't be so sure that the peace talk is going to bring, is going to be fruitful in any way. The Taliban will still continue to kill people there. And what is Pakistan going to look like if, if, if the Taliban leaders yes. in government? Yes. So I think we have to be open-minded about, let's create a balance in regards to how we deal with these issues. Technology is not going to help them. I mean, I think in terms of Africa, it's, it's awful. I wish I was a god that could solve all these issues. But I don't, I don't think that we helped it much by partitioning the country, taking it, exploiting it. And um, if, I mean, Africa could be extremely rich, it could be the richest country in the world if we would stop taking all the wealth out of it and let the countries that have it own it. And it might go a long way to, I mean, we have, we have Muslims in this country as well, but we, we managed to deal with it. We're not having massive riots in the streets. We have you know, many religions in this country, and we're becoming a sort of irreligious country and trying to find a way that everybody can sort of live together. And I don't see why they can't do that in Africa either. 
I mean, there is extremism, of course, but I, I don't know what to do about it, really. Mm -hmm. yeah. Last thing on, on that, um, in the 16th and 17th centuries in Europe, uh, the rise of Protestantism, um, we fought 30 and 80 year wars. It looks superficially at least, there's many of those ingredients in the kind of wars that are happening within Islam, not just between Islam and Christians. And because we don't like to talk about religion, we, we back away from them. And I think we could be looking at generational stuff. This is not something, this is stuff that the grandchildren will be sorting out and still dealing with. The other thing, the last comment I would like to make is, in terms of the robot killers, in terms of the archives, in terms of killing in Pakistan. I'm not sure if, no, if you've got a, a number, total number for the people who've been killed by drones over the last 10 years, maybe? Well, there's, there's a lot of very different figures. What's the highest number that you've seen? No, the, 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 the moderate number, which is from the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, right. is about 1,300, 1,200. But of those identified leaders, uh, actual leaders, is about 25. So so let's, let's double that and call it 2,500. In three months, 850,000 people were killed in Rwanda, largely with machetes and farming implements. Mm -hmm. So while we get focused on this high-end technology, most of the deaths in the world are killed by knives and AK-47s and handguns in the United States. That's all I wanted to ask about. Road deaths. Oh, we, haven't road got, deaths, we haven't yeah. got much time, I'm sorry. <laughs> We've got two minutes left. It's really great. Uh, the amount of civilians killed by RPAs mm -hmm. um, against the amount of civilians killed by bombs coming from airplanes and strike fighters. What's the difference in that? Because shouldn't you ban joint strike fighters as well? Whether they cost ten times or even more than one drum. They're used very differently, though. Mm -hmm. And I, w I agree with you. I mean, I, I, when you look at the, when you look at, if you look a little bit at the history of air power, I'd have to agree with you. But uh, I'm a robotics professor, so I'm attacking robot uh, planes. But can I just say one other thing? It's a fact that not many people maybe know, is that there's more chance of being stung to death by bees than there is of being killed by a terrorist attack. <laughs> In 1922 and 1923, the major powers of the world, that was the colonial powers largely, met at The Hague with the intention of banning large aircraft because of the threat from bombing. Historically, the British were at the forefront of making sure that that ban did not happen because we had a huge empire and we wanted to be able to bomb people pretty much at random. And and it actually was used for, for empire policing. So we tried to ban bombing from from heavy aircraft 90 years ago. Didn't happen then, won't happen now. I think we have to look at some other means of, of sorry to be pessimistic, no, but I no, think, I, think it's right. I, I am pessimistic and I think we have to find some other means of normalizing within society what we will allow our governments to do, never mind what other people will do. Thank you very much. I, I just want to thank the speakers, but I'll, I'll just leave you with one thought. There's lots of, yeah, thank you for the questions, really good questions, excellent questions. There's another aspect to this which is, um, I think uh, Peter mentioned about how it makes, how drones might make killing more easy, or well, he, he denied that, but I think in terms of the people who drive the drones, maybe it doesn't, it isn't any easier, but in terms of the politicians who try to justify or use drones, they can say, well, we haven't lost any of our men, uh, you know, we're only killing enemies or even the first thing for actual damage. So in some ways, use of drones or technology, robots, is um, making war fighting more easier to, to, to participate in. And therefore, we're not talking to each other. Noel said something about how technology can't solve all the problems. These are human problems. It needs humans to solve them, not technology. So if we're going to rely on technology to solve the problems, you won't solve them. You'll prolong them, make them worse. That's my opinion, sorry, this is my opinion. Uh, but that's something to think about. And um, there's lots of other issues concerned with drones, of course, which we haven't touched upon. Surveillance, privacy, all of those things. But we didn't have time for all that. <laughs> so I uh, hope you've had got something from this. I certainly have. And uh, can we thank the speakers and the questions?